Welcome to Accelerate Your Wealth, a podcast by Rebecca Robertson, founder and director of Evolution Financial Planning. We hope you enjoy the show and please feel free to leave us a review. It really does help. Feel free to connect with us on Facebook, LinkedIn and Instagram or head over to www.rebeccarobertson.co.uk or our sponsor, Evolution Financial Planning for regulated advice on www.evolutionfinancialplanning.co.uk forward slash podcast. Well, today I'm going to be joined by the beautiful, lovely Catherine Watkin. Catherine, founder of From Selling From The Heart, is a leading expert in authentic and heart-centred sales. After a highly successful 20 plus years career in sales, now works with her own business or other business owners who are gifted and passionate about what they do, but struggle in business because they feel awkward about traditional sales methods. She teaches them how to sell in a way that feels authentic and comfortable so that they can grow a great business while still feeling true to their values. Catherine is also an authentic and inspiring role model for how it is possible to create successful business without resorting to sleazy and manipulative sales and marketing techniques. So Catherine is joining me today and we are having a whole conversation about sales, marketing and business models. So hold on for your hats and let's get chatting to Catherine. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Yes, me, um, t- me too. I'm, I can't believe I've known you for so, how long and you've not been in my podcast before. This is crazy. Actually, no, you came on one of my original original ones. Yes, when I first I, launched. I came on one to talk about wealth building and how I, what I was doing to build my own long-term wealth rather That's than it. talking about anything relating to my business yeah that was it exactly no perfect and so what I'll do everyone that's listening I will put in the show notes that previous um recordings you should definitely go and check that out Catherine's really good at sharing her expertise so you're gonna love today so my first question and to kick us off Catherine you've got 20 years of sales experience where did that start for you Oh, and it's probably even more than that, because it was about that when I started this business. And wow, I've been running this business for 12 years now. So it's probably more like 30 years of sales experience. Where did it start for me? Well, it started for me when when I left. I did psychology at university, but I left university in 1991. And if anyone listening remembers that far back, in 1991, there were no jobs. Everyone knew there were no jobs. This is what, and I came to believe this. Everyone knew there were no jobs. So I really bought into this idea there were no jobs and I didn't even apply for any. And instead I went off traveling. And um, over quite a number of years, I traveled and did different things. And as a result of that, one of the jobs I had was as a tour rep in the Greek islands. Oh, nice. and what I didn't know was, you know, I thought oh, I'm gonna go and be a holiday rep. Sounds all wonderful. What I didn't know then is that the real purpose of those holiday reps is not really to look after the holiday makers. It's to sell them day trips. So the companies really make their profit on those day trips. And so we used to go to the airport and in the middle of the night, our holiday makers would be arriving. We'd bring them back to their hotel by like three or four in the morning. And at 9 a.m. that morning, these poor sleep deprived people were getting this like sales pitch you know these are all the day trips and tours you can go on and sign up here and that was how it started for me actually I was only 23 um I didn't think I'd signed up for a sales job but all most most of what I earned that summer came from commission on those day trips and that was the beginning of what became a nearly 20 year actual working career in sales in various different roles amazing it sounds like a nice little job just to, to actually it sounds quite nice get lots of nice tan and fun for that kind of you know that age group so it's a nice way to to start your career I mean I, I worked in a bank and um you think when you work in a bank that there's no sales you're giving advice and you're being you know opening accounts for people and being helpful um but actually it's it sales and it's quite quite highly targeted actually I'd probably say out of my whole financial services career it's the highest targeted role um and if you had I don't know if you served on the till 
300 people, you should have expected to open up a certain number of credit cards or a certain number of bank accounts. Um, so do you think that that's where people are a little bit wary when it comes to sales because they they're experiencing maybe a bad a, a, a being sold to all the time so then they don't want to sell themselves is, is is that where some of that psychology comes from do you think I'm not sure it's so much that they're being sold to when they're not expecting to because I think that when sales is done really well People don't really get that icky, oh, I'm being sold to feeling. We often love the experience. So one of the jobs I did after that role as a tour rep was I ended up working as a travel consultant selling. Um, I specialized in Australia and New Zealand and around the world. And I would put together people's itineraries and book them these dream holidays. It was absolutely sales and very heavily targeted. But the people who came to book those holidays loved that whole experience of me upselling them a more exciting hotel or whatever. So I think that when sales is done really well, people love it. It just feels like really good service and it feels helpful. I think what happens, though, is that we've all experienced really bad sales. Sales that is clumsy, that is very, that feels like it's very self-serving for the person doing the sales, that, that doesn't seem to listen to us, that is pushy. And we notice that sales. We often don't notice the good sales. We, we barely register it somehow. We're just like, oh, I'm so excited I bought this thing. We notice the bad sales. And then we come to associate sales with only the bad sales because we didn't recognize the good sales as sales. And so as a result of that, we end up thinking, I don't want to do that. I don't want to manipulate people. I don't want to push people around. I don't want to make people feel like they have to buy this thing just because it suits me. And that's where people develop a block to sales and think, I don't want to have to, if this is what it's going to take for me to be successful in my business, I don't want to do that to other people. Yeah, I totally. And I, I, I see that a lot. I see so many women that have amazing businesses. They're very busy in the business, but they have such potential to to grow it. And they're, they're often they see whatever the extra thing is. Oh, I, I can't do that. I can't sell. You know, I couldn't cross sell or um, I couldn't position this other thing or I, I, I'm i just good at doing what I'm doing and that's working and that's OK. But there's so much potential that they could sort of step a little bit out of their comfort zone and, and they could potentially have more revenue, add more value to those clients, actually provide even bigger and better service, which the clients probably will thank, thank them for Absolutely. in the way that you described. Um, yeah. But they're they're putting it off they're, 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 they're the fear I guess of I don't know is it rejection that that people are feeling that they're going to get they don't want all a feeling in, in that they don't want to be positioning and therefore come across as icky sales well I see a lot the fear of re rejection it does come into it but the bigger piece for me with particularly like you said with female business owners is that they tend to get stuck more in the I don't want to come across as if I'm being pushy and self-serving and I'm just trying to sell to people. I'm so nervous that it's going to look like I'm just trying to sell, that I'm not going to even say anything. And they spend too much time in that energy and, and not in the energy of I'm here to help and I'm here to serve and I'm here to do what's best for this person. And I know what's best for this person. What's best for this person is that they have X, Y, Z help and I can give them that and I'm going to let them know how that would work and I'm going to let them make their own decision. They spend too much time trapped in the, I don't want to come across as pushy. So that feels so awkward. I'm just going to do nothing. And then it's not serving them and their business and it's not serving their clients either. Yeah, totally. And, and that, that's often because we're passionate about helping people. Um, most of the you know, genuine business owners, especially females, but there's males as well. They genuinely just want to, they're passionate about what they do, the product or the service. Um, and they're just rather, well, take it or leave it. Like it's there, here it is. Um, if you want it, here it is. And I, I have a bit of a habit of doing that where um, I'd say to people after an initial inquiry, this is what we do. This is what we offer. Um, let 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 me know if you want to come back. You know, come back to us. And then, um, I I wasn't really great at following up, so I got Katie in my team. She'd follow up after a couple of weeks, and it would just be a case of, do you have any questions? How can we help you? Like it was a very service led, mm -hmm. 
but I, I, I didn't like doing it. And so I've got people in my team to help me with some of those things that I don't feel comfortable doing because I don't want to come across as that pushy financial advisor that's trying to sell them something. Um, I'd rather come across as, you know, like I genuinely, I, this is how I can help you, like you described. But mm. if the person can't see it and they're not seeing it at that point after two conversations, one with me, one with Katie, and then a follow-up call, I'm on my site. I don't really want to push push the fact but sometimes I find people just need time and actually it's when you serve them and you ask questions like I don't know um is there anything that I can help you you're better than this than me but is there something that I can help you know help you um to or provide you with information to, to help make that decision easier for you was there something you wasn't sure about or you know what, uh, clarifying questions I guess you would call that um, but people aren't that maybe self-aware if that in their sales process, right? Of doing that. I think one of the biggest things is just that I that popped into my mind while you were talking then is that very often, and I see this very, very often, it's probably the most common thing that people um, need to work on when they come and work with me, is that a lot of business owners, and I'm not suggesting this is you, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> they, they tend to take it as given that the client understands why working with them would be a good idea so here's what I can do and here's what I can help you and would you like to go ahead and the client doesn't really know because they're like well you've told me what you do but I don't really get it get I don't it. Really get how it relates to me and my problems and what I need and so I think one of the most important things is being able to is to not because people are so close to their own businesses. They just they just think it's self-evident why this thing is a good thing. Oh, so I'm an EFT practitioner. So it's totally obvious why this is a really good idea. But the thing is, it's not to the clients. And so being able to very clearly articulate not just I'm going to do this with you. But this is why this is a good thing for you. This is why it's going to help you achieve what you want or solve that problem you've got. And this is the outcome it's going to give you at the end. So the client can come away thinking, I really, really understand why doing this work is is, is important. And then having done that, if again, the business owner then wraps up the conversation, I often say that people don't ask the direct question enough. Do you want to go ahead? It's not being pushy. It's not being manipulative. I don't teach closing techniques. If the person's not sure, I've got no magic wand that's going to bat batter somebody into the corner and get them to say yes. And there are downsides of being able to do that anyway. But as simple as, you know, having explained all of this to you, is this something you'd like to go ahead with? Would you like to get booked in? The, the client can say yes or no. Yeah. But that can reduce, those two things can reduce a lot the need to follow up because if you've communicated really clearly why this is of value and is going to benefit the client and you do that really clearly then in that moment while they're listening I get they get something that I call the internal yes which is where they are having this internal feeling and thought process that goes wow this sounds like just what I need she's explained that so clearly and she's linked it to my situation so well that I can really clearly see why this is good and I think I want to do it now they haven't said anything yet but then you end the conversation instead of saying so have a think about it and let me know what you think you end the conversation with so what do you think would you like to go ahead if they're already sitting there with this internal yes bubbling up because they're already leaning towards it and you say would you like to go ahead they'll go well yeah why not let's get booked in now or even sometimes gosh I didn't come on this call expecting to sign up today but the way you've explained everything yes I do want to go ahead right now yeah totally I think the key thing there that you mentioned was um that they've explained it to my circumstances they've made it very relevant and then that comes back to having good conversations and asking good questions um, and that takes that takes time so they're not like five second conversations right that takes time to understand the individual um, and I think in an automated world, we're sometimes a little bit quick to say, well, here's the sales page, sign up here. And actually, we, we're not having enough conversations. Are you, are you finding that, that people are automating too much? I don't know if people automate too much because that can work 
as well at a certain level. But what I see is that people will um, switch into what I call one-to-many sales mm. too early. So one-to-many sales would be a sales page or a webinar presentation or anything that's designed to speak to, to lots and lots and lots of people at once is that people go into the one-to-many before they've really mastered the one-to-one sales conversations and then they don't know what they need to say in the one-to-many sales process. Because like you just said, in a one-to-one sales conversation, you can ask the person questions. You can really get to know what's going on for them. You can understand their worries, their concerns, their fears, their dreams, their aspirations. And when you come to present your offer, you can directly match that. Only if you can genuinely help, but you can directly match that back to those worries, concerns, dreams and aspirations. But everyone's got a different set of worries, fears, dreams and aspirations. So when you're selling one to many, like you're relying on selling from a sales page, you can't guess what that person needs to hear. So you've got to cover off maybe the top five or six sets of worries, fears, dreams, aspirations, concerns on that page. And it takes a real skill to be able to put together a sales presentation, whether it's in writing or verbally over a webinar or workshop in a way that lands with the majority of your audience. And I think a lot of people, they're so quick. They, you know, they're on the passive income bandwagon and they just want to make sales while they sleep. And they're very quick to want to automate things, but they haven't done the groundwork to make that automation really really effective and when you know that you can sell really effectively really good conversion rates in your one-to-one sales conversations now when you translate that into your automated it has a lot more power to it amazing I like the way you describe that thank you I think that's a really important point that once you understand the your client that much more and you have better conversations then you can shift into doing potentially wider audiences or potentially wider products that aren't all one-to-one um so that thank you for that I think that's a really good point and it brings me nicely on to sort of the next sort of subject I thought was quite relevant to talk to you about which is that whole one-to-one where I see a lot of um you know I I'm I'm primarily one-to-one um I um, I did have a membership at one point, which was not my reg is not a regulated, obviously thing. Um, I had I think seventy five members in there, so I'm paying between thirty and fifty pounds a month, um, and I enjoyed it. But it it it, it felt like at times it was, um, I was delivering all the things and doing all the right stuff, but I'd suddenly be, be talking to like two people. <laughs> And it 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 didn't light me up. It didn't didn't fill me up. And then um, I think it was around sort of that COVID time, and it was it, lots of things were going on. And I decided that to, to scale back, and I actually just wanted to focus in, on my regulated business. Um, and I also did a mastermind over that period of time. So I ran a mastermind at two different instances, which was like basically group coaching, I guess. Um, and I was just about to sell a course, an online course. So I've sort of done done that whole passive if you want to call it it's not really like you say it's not really passive there's an awful lot of work involved in it um but there's nothing passive about running a membership no definitely not there's there's so much work in that goes into that um so as a financial advisor I, I not not many financial advisors have done all that kind of stuff um and I decided to focus on my regulated business and I have at the moment, about uh, 75, 80 clients, I look after those clients and I'm paid ongoing fees from those clients. It's not passive, <laughs> but it does mean that um, I've never lost a client. So um, it means that I have a, not a guarantee, but I have a form of income coming in. And it was a big shift for me to to, to make that decision. When I, years ago, I took my different financial exams I was doing primarily insurances and mortgages and wills, which are almost like one off sort of sales, if you like. And I decided to make that shift. And it was one of the best things I did. But I put it off for about six years <laughs> because it was going to be a big shift, a big change. And I wish I'd done it sooner. But hey, there you go. Um, life happens in that way. So I see a lot of business women that are running great coaching businesses or, you know, you mentioned EFT, you know, maybe therapies or. Um, they might be social media people, for example, they're helping people do sales, their social media. And it's all very, I know, for example, um, 
a lovely lady who runs a PA business and she's just been trying to figure out, well, how do I go from looking after people on a one to one basis? Well, but I'm not having to constantly sell, but I'm constantly having to bring in more one to one. How can I be selling more effectively to then bring in potentially a larger group of clients, whether it's a, a like a webinar that you pay for or it's a group coaching or a membership? But how do I know? where to start with that and I mean I know that's quite a broad question to ask you so I'm sorry to put you on the spot because it does depend on you know for example like they're a dog walker compared to a therapist they're two very different businesses is is there a process that people should go through to figure out what their potential it's not passive but a one to greater audience this is exactly the one of the core things that I cover in my membership. So I, I, you know, my business is called Selling from the Heart. And when people first get to know me, they very often come and do my authentic sales program and learn how to get those paying clients flowing. But then beyond that, it's one thing to, well, now I know how to attract and enroll a client. But now what do I want my business model to look like? And you're talking about business model. And I'm very focused on creating a business you love because I myself have gone off down tracks where I've created a business. I created a business, very successful six figure business, but it didn't light me up. And so I've come to see that it's absolutely essential that a business owner creates a business model that they love. The, doing the thing they love isn't always enough if they don't enjoy the business model. And you've talked about, you know, you mainly do one-to-one now. I'm actually the opposite. I do pretty much all group stuff. I've got a, co- a group course and I've got a membership. Um, and and the, the, the one probably, probably the most important thing that I could say about this is There is no, I don't care what anybody tells you. I don't care how convincing their marketing is. There is no business model that is better in some way than another one. They are all, they've all got their pluses and they've all got their challenges. One isn't easier than the other. And I would even go so far as to say that actually, if you want to work on your own and you don't want to be managing a big team, and you don't want to have a lot of complex tech to manage and have to maybe hire somebody to look after that. The easiest business model of all of them, if you get your pricing right, is your one-to-one. Now, I say that with a one-to-many business. Um, I do firmly believe that the easiest business to a certain level is your one-to-one because of the complexity of the one-to-many. And a lot of businesses that are not they're they're not necessarily when they're selling their courses they're not necessarily painting the true picture of what needs to go on behind the scenes because yes of course I mean I'll be launching my course but in a couple of in about another month from when we're recording this I'll be running webinars and challenges and there'll be all sorts of events to sell to people one to many and of course it's fantastic because I don't have to have lots of one-to-one sales conversations to enroll people into that course but I've had to do one heck of a lot more marketing to get the numbers of people into those events in order to sell to them. Whereas if I'm selling one-to-one, I only need to attract one person to have one sales conversation to attract, to enroll one client. Now yeah. it's not quite that simple either, but I think people get very fixed on, they've seen somebody's big marketing message and they've got this bee in their bonnet about this business model over here is somehow going to be the holy grail and everything's going to be easy. And there isn't. The only business model that works is the one that works for your personality and your lifestyle. And it happens that for you, you found that your sweet spot is your one-to-one. I've actually found that my sweet my sweet spot is my one-to-many, but I'm under no illusions. You know, I have a team of people who I have how many people? Five parts, two full-timers and three part-timers and a lot of complex tech that is not in my strength. So yeah. it's not a super simple business model by any stretch of the imagination. And I, and I really appreciate that that viewpoint because um, I'm glad I did all the things that I did before. Don't get me wrong, because I sort of, I, you know, I, I understand marketing and I understand business models much, much more now. And it's not to say I'll never do it again. 
Um, but what I found for what I was offering, people wanted one to one. So I even had after I closed my membership, people that had actioned went and set up set up a pension on their own or an ISA on their own. And then a year later, I put out an offer, which was a one to one offer, um, which basically meant I could do it for them. And they literally I had a list of 20 people jump on that and say, I, I did it in your membership, but can you just do it for me now? And that was really a really clear message that people wanted to work with me one to one rather than in a one to many environment in a in a membership. Um, and so and, and from a revenue perspective, it was, you know, one client for me is I don't, I don't know, in an annual revenue could be 100 people in a membership. Well, for me, it's a lot easier for me to look after one client than it is 100 members. So it does depend on price point and, and such like. But so I, but I really appreciate what you're saying in, in that where your energy goes, money flows. And I think that is very relevant to what you're saying. And it's a bit like when you get these marketeers that are telling you to do lives every day or do TikToks or do this and do that. Same applies, right? Because if you're not actually enjoying it and you're not putting the right energy into it, then you can't sustain it and you can't be consistent. Yeah, if you, don't, if you don't love marketing, you do need to question whether you should have a business model that requires high volume marketing. So just to illustrate, when you were talking, I thought I did the same sum. Well, I have to use a calculator for even very simple sums, but my membership is £47 a month. Now, to make 4700 I need 100 members. So my marketing probably needs to attract 1,000 people in order to get that 100 people in. Whereas when I do offer one-to-one, -one, which is much more rare, but if I was to switch and create a one-to-one -one business itself, that would be one client. That that um, When I normally charge 5,000 for one client for business mentoring, that's one client. The amount of marketing I need to do compared to to attract 100, we're in, we're, we're in a completely different type of a business model now. And yeah. people don't always see it that way. So. I think when you're doing the bigger numbers, it's like if you're just planning to have a membership with 100 people, then don't bother, right? Really, that's the message. If you're talking, oh, well, I'm going to build a massive membership, you know, maybe 500 people, then that's that's possibly more worthwhile. It takes time to get there. I'm not saying you're going to do that in the first uh, six but months. But also it depends on your strategy for your membership. So my strategy for my membership was always I wanted it to be a core income stream. Yeah. So it is the core, in, the core income stream. But some people create a membership and the strategy is is that it's um, like a paid nurture funnel. They're, they're nurturing people a little bit like actually, although you didn't do it consciously, that's what happened for you. You had people in your membership paying you a lower amount of money. They built their trust and respect with you. And then when you offered a high end offer, they jumped. So some people have a membership. They're not really necessarily concerned with growing it big. They might have 50 to 100 members. But by having 50 to 100 members at a low cost amount means that they've got this pool of people who when they offer their high higher price thing will jump at it so it's also down to the strategy and the purpose for that business model as well so yeah this is like I know we came to talk more about the sales stuff but this is also one of my passions as well getting the right business model to make your business actually sustainable you said at the beginning you've been doing this for 13 years you've known me since the beginning I've been doing this for 12 years you know there's a reason we're here I mean I've made mistakes I've created business models that don't work for me that's how I've become so passionate about this topic but the reason that we're still here is that our businesses are sustainable for us. We're able to sustain them because we don't hate half of what we have to do every day. And, oh, you know, so much easier. when I was doing all of those things, the mastermind, the membership, I was exhausted and running my regulated business, which was paying for all of that other stuff. You know, pay, you know it, was like it was literally piggybacking off the off the back of it. Um, I was I was just so tired. I didn't really have much like time to think really um whereas now you know if I want to take an afternoon off I can you know it's not there's not that same sort of kind of pressure but you know we we, we learn from our mistakes and we refigure things out definitely but I think what's why it's a really important conversation and it, it does link to selling is because again you know there's a there's a knack to selling on camera there's a knack to how you present and that might not be your skill set so what I I'm, I'm not pointing fingers at any particular coach or model or anything here, but um, N Nicola Hulin is, 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 a, is in a different business coach. And what Nicola talks about, and she's done it for years, is this cookie cutter approach to business. And what you're describing is that 
you know, and so you go to some people and they have that what that that is it what's been the right experience for them it's worked for them yes. but it doesn't mean and then, then people go and do it and it's like oh it's not worked oh you haven't done it properly N- no they probably oh I did it I did it I, I followed it to the T it just wasn't right for me and I think that's okay but I think what questions I guess could people what what sort of things would you encourage people to ask themselves when it comes to what kind of model would be right for them? It, or is it just too broad of a question? So one of the things that I um, talk about within, it is it is fairly broad. It comes down really to people. There's a few different bits. One is really understanding themselves. So within, uh, there's a personality profiling system that I've always loved. It's called Wealth Dynamics. There's lots of personality profiling, but this is the one that's always worked best for me. And it helps me understand my clients best. That can really help you to understand yourself. You also, if you understand your strengths and weaknesses, what you really hate doing, um, what you really love doing, you need to block out the noise. It's, re- it's so easier said than done, but it's so important to tap into what really lights me up, what feels really fulfilling and nourishing and nurturing for me to do. And for a lot of clients who work with me, that's their one-to-one business. And often they come to me and they say, Catherine, I've been told everywhere, all over the place, online, everywhere for the last five years, that if I want my business to really work, then I have to create this one-to-many model. And I say, no, you don't. How much do you want to earn? How much do you need to earn to cover your lifestyle um, or to cover your financial goals? What do you really, really love to do? Now let's design a business. And if what you love to do is to work one-on-one, face-to-face with your clients, then if you get your pricing right and your business model right, you can do that and it will be easier for you than if you... And so when someone comes to me and wants to talk about the one-to-many, I want them to feel like I do about that. Like I want to do it because I just can't help myself because working only one-to-one feels somehow limiting. I want to make my knowledge and my teaching available to as many people as I possibly can. Like for 47 pound a month, people can come and learn from me everything they need to know about business. If later on they feel they want to go deeper and they want to work That's with someone. good value, by the way. Do that, <laughs> yeah, because that lights me up, this idea. It's really accessible. There's no barrier. You don't have to pay thousands or tens of thousands to learn this stuff and it's and I and that's a passion of mine and I want that's what I want to hear when people want to create a one-to-many model if somebody says to me I want you to I want to learn from you how to start and launch my online course and the reason I want to do that is I've been told on the internet that this is the way to make my business easier I'm like "Uh uh-uh we ain't doing that like it's got to be because you feel called to work one-to-many and I feel that calling so I get it but it's got to be the right reason do you think um that passion and that calling that you describe um when you're in a maybe a burnout um not feeling very well does that does that affect that passion and that decision making I mean I I know the answer to this is yes because I've been there (laughs) um but when it comes to maybe wanting quick what you seem to be quick resolve and I'll go and pay for this course or work with this person or they've got the magic answer um it it, sometimes when you're feeling tired you make different different decisions and you jump into things and it's a I think people seem to collect courses these days and they're not actually finished them actually sort of in a in a little bit circling back around to the the sales Mm. conversation piece where People sometimes make a decision from a very disempowered place where they're desperate, they're looking for solutions, they don't know which way to turn, they don't know who to trust. They come across someone who's very convincing. That very convincing person says, give me £12,000 and everything's going to be okay. And they just go, oh my gosh, I'm so desperate and you're promising me everything and here you are, here's my money. And then you've got this from an empowered place, which is I understand where I'm at. I understand my gaps and my weaknesses. I know I don't have this very valuable skill like sales, and I know that I'm not going to be successful without it. And I'm being discerning about the fact that that's the next thing I need to learn. And again, within membership, this is something I try and really focus my clients on, which is understanding what is the next important thing in what order. So yes, there might be all these 15 courses you want to do. 
but you don't buy them all at once. You decide which is the thing that is next for me. And then you focus on that. And maybe you'll need to buy a course to do it. Maybe, but then you do that and you implement it and then you move on to the next thing. And I think when we're actually in our sales conversations, as well as business owners, it's something important to be aware of, because often the clients who come to us and they sign up to work with us because they're in that very disempowered state, depending on what you do, it might not always be the case with your work, but depending on what we do, that's often not the right decision for the client. And it can often make for a difficult client relationship because if the client is very disempowered and they're signing up with you because they think you're going to be like the savior and it's going to be the answer to all their problems, mm. we still all have to work through the, you know, business isn't some magic bullet or everyone will be doing it. We still have to work through all the steps in all the right order and put all the pieces in place. And we're going to try things and it's not going to work. And we're going to have to take a step back and readjust and try again that, you know, you can get the support and the teaching and the mentoring, but you still got to be a, you know, if I think the clients that come, so a lot of people do very well in business by creating an environment that almost nurtures very disempowered people and encourages them to buy. Right. But sometimes the easier clients to work with are the clients who come from that more empowered place. I know there are gaps. I know there are things I need to learn. And I've decided I want to learn those things from you. And I know it's not going to be completely easy. I know there are no guarantees, but here I am and I'm here for the journey. And those are the easy clients to work with. Do you think it's getting harder to sell now that pe there's more competition and that there's people are being maybe with online, they've been sold to all the time online now. Um, I, mean, I watched something the other day, which was a... Um, Chinese digital factory and they were scanning around and there were just these pods of people on camera with lights on them and, and mics and they were selling products and you know so if you just go online you're being so sold, sold to constantly let alone when you go down the supermarket and you, you know it's, it's they're everywhere um do you think that then there's there's more online coaches there's more products that are being sold online do you think it's then becoming harder to sell or do you need to just is there, is there a different way to approach it these days? I think if it's becoming harder to sell right now, I think it's more to do with the economic climate. It's more to do with people worrying about finances, worrying about their mortgage interest rates, um, finding that there's not as much spare cash. For a lot of people, actually, they're not any less well off or they're not massively less well off but they have developed this fear and this caution because it's what we're being told in the news all the time. And I think that is probably making it a bit harder for people, particularly for a lot of the clients that I work with, what there's, even what you do, it's not something that people perceive as absolutely essential, like putting food on the table and heating the home, absolutely essential, you're gonna have to pay for that. Um, sorting out my pension I know I should do it but maybe I could put it off for another couple of years working on the fact that I've got really high anxiety or that my children are out of control or my business is failing people don't always see those things as the highest priority when they're looking at their spending so I yeah. think it does create an extra level of challenge and I do believe that right now anybody who's trying to run a business who hasn't had some sort of sales training is going to struggle because it's so much harder and we don't have as much of people going oh you seem nice and that sounds <laughs> nice so hey yeah I wouldn't mind coming and talking to you once a week for an hour let's just do it there's less of that happening people are making more discerning decisions in terms of competition I don't know I'm going to say I don't have a definite opinion on that I think we've you know for as long as I've been alive we've been bombarded with advertising and I know that from my own experience, yes, I'm bombarded with advertising, but I ignore most of it. And every yeah. now and then we come across a message that just lands with us because today that's the message we need to hear. Or we come across a person and there's something about them and they land with us because there's this resonance. So I feel like, yes, if we talk about coaches, there are 20 bazillion coaches out there right now. But the person who's looking for coaching doesn't see all 20 bazillion. They might come across two or three or four into their own personal awareness bubble. And out of those two or three or four, they might come across, they're going to feel more drawn to the message and the personality of one rather than another. So I feel like, yes, it's busier online. It's more overwhelming. People are getting better at 
um, shutting that out. So we need to be more mindful of our marketing messages and making sure that they're really clear and they're speaking to our ideal client. But when it comes to the sales, I feel like, you know, good old fashioned, I'd say old fashioned because I'm always like, I don't like the old school sales, but good solid sales skills to communicate clearly why what you have to offer is valuable, to know how to take somebody through a sales conversation, to be able to price your work in a way that actually supports your lifestyle and be able to communicate the value of that. So your client sees that as valuable at that price point as well. This is the foundational stuff. And this is what will make it so this is what will make it less hard for people during more difficult economic times when people are like tightening their belts a bit more. No, brilliant. I love that answer. Thank you so much. I think that's um, all really relevant. It, it really comes back down to business basics, really. Everything mm -hmm. you've described there and knowing th those those existing clients, how you can serve them um, and how you can encourage more sales, more ref referrals and just that, all the basics just are just Definitely. so key. And what you've said there is just making me think as well, you know, because you did use the example of coaches and particularly if you're in business and you're online and you're on social media, you're going to get bombarded with messages from business coaches. So any business coach does need to be able to in some way stand out in, in what they do. But if I think about what you do, financial, you know, financial advice, um, if I need financial advice, I'm going to think of you first. But if I didn't know you and you are my, you know, I do work with you, I'm a client of yours as well. But if I didn't know and I wanted to find a financial advisor, my Facebook feed is not full of financial advisors. No. I would probably end up asking somebody who they could refer or Googling for somebody in my local area. So I think because it's noisy online, a lot of people think oh, there's so many people who do what I do. How will I ever stand out? But everybody's in their own little microcosm and everybody's social media feed is unique to them. And we only see a tiny, each person only really sees a tiny fraction of everything. Mm -hmm. And so for most people, depending on what they do, there's maybe not as much competition as they think there is. There's not as much visible competition as they think there is. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, definitely. My, my, most of my business is referrals and recommendations. So um it, it's, it's sort of the cornerstone I'm quite and I'm but I've been doing this a long time I've tried everything I think the funniest thing I've done is I, I did a, a stand at a psychic fair um mm. and I've done wedding fairs I've done oh you name it I've done it um so I've done I've done done the graft um if you like and it does it does take yeah. that and this is actually what you're saying is very very common so many of many clients who've worked with me either in my programs or in my mentoring you know, at the early days, they're figuring out what's their marketing sweet spot, what are they going to enjoy, what's going to work for them. They're not necessarily, in, they're not always enjoying it. It's a little bit like, oh, I have to do this marketing thing. But typically after a few years, and it's not instant, but after a few years, I've seen so many of my clients who've switched to a point where they're barely doing any marketing at all because 90% of their business is coming from referrals and they're fully booked and it's and, and they're in that flow. And there's loads and loads of businesses who get to that point. So some people start in business and they, you know, when you first start out, it's like it's like 80% marketing or 90% marketing. And yeah. people are thinking, oh gosh. I didn't sign up to be a marketer. This isn't what I really want to be doing. I want to be working with clients. Maybe it's not for me. But if they're willing to push on through those first few years and do what it takes to get themselves better known and spread the word and work with more clients, if they do a good job, the referrals will flow. If they set up a good referral program, that helps as well. But not everybody needs to do that. And, you know, the longer you're in business and the more established you are, typically the less marketing you actually need to do. So that's the good news. That's, yeah, that is. Yes, very true. I do have a very good um, website person and I, so I, I, mine's very SEO focused and then, yeah, referral. So it's um, I'm quite lucky that I but I love my, I love doing my podcast and I, I enjoy giving, you know, people that I know like yourself and sharing your knowledge. Right. Um. I've really loved our chat today. I'm I'm sure we 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 could talk for England and, and, and talk for hours, but um just share with us so what have you got coming up shortly? People obviously listening to this in early September, um, they could end up listening to it in January next year. So how do people work with you? And um obviously you mentioned your membership. What else have you got coming up? Okay, so there are two main ways that I work with people. I do occasionally open up some one-to-one, -one, but that's not part of my core business model. So <laughs> I have a course that I run over eight weeks every October. 
and um, it's designed, it's it's almost a bit of a business in a box. It's designed to get people enrolling paying clients from a standing start. So if they're brand new to business, they've never signed up a client, they will have clients signed up by the end of that eight weeks. That's what it's designed to do. But a lot of more established business owners also do it because they're struggling to enroll clients and it works, the principles work just the same. And then I have the business, for the, that course is called Get More Clients Saying Yes, does what it says on the tin. And then I have a member, okay. and then I have a membership called Business from the Heart, which runs all year round. And I support people in a broader sense through that because with the course, I'm basically going, you know, now you know how to attract a client, invite them to a sales conversation, have a sales conversation, enroll them, and you've designed a package or program that is going to work for your business. You've got that nailed. Now there are other pieces. What's your long-term business model actually going to be? What marketing is going to be your sweet spot? And all the other bits to do with running a business. And that membership, um, that runs that runs all year round. And I typically open that up for enrollment twice a year. But I won't say the months now just because sometimes that changes. So I don't want to sort of pin that down. And if people go to my website and the easiest way to get there is sellingfromtheheart.com. Um, there is a seven steps to yes process for an authentic sales conversation. So I actually share that with you for free. You can sign up and get the structure for the sales conversation. There's a guide to creating a business you can fall in love with um, and then, you know, there's, a, there's there's other things on there as well, but that would be a really, those two things, create a business you can fall in love with and the seven steps to yes for the structure for a effective, non-sleazy, non-pushy sales conversation would be the ways to sort of enter my world. If you then like what I share, you'll hear about my course and my membership when they do open. And if you think it's not for you, you can unsubscribe and I don't look at my unsubscribe. So nobody has to think <laughs> about that. <laughs> and no I don't either I was one, once my team started telling me oh you had 20 people unsubscribed from that email I was like don't don't tell me that I don't need to know that I don't um, care because I don't create content for the people who don't like it I create the content for the people who do love it, do so like I'm it. Less yeah. worried about the people who leave they're not they're obviously we're not right for each other that's not a problem and exactly and I think my open rate's gone from really good it was like 22 percent and I changed it and made it more personal and I just do it myself every week and I'm talking about the dogs and the cats and the horses I'm on your mailing I, list. I get that. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know if people, people, but every once a week I have a client going, "Oh, I love your emails." Um, and I think I've got like 40 45 percent open rate now. So I think you know, sometimes I might have had twenty people unsubscribe, but but they're great two ways to work with you and get some, you know, get some really. They sound really good resources. Definitely go and check those out. We will put the um, links in the comments. So go and check Catherine out. And you're on social media. Where do you hang out the most social media wise, Catherine? Um, so here's a bit of a news flash. I'm not strong on social media. 12 years in business, multi six figure revenue, never really done social media. So that might, you know, that's also something I talk about. I love a lot. that. Um, I do. I'm on Facebook, but I don't really interact on there much. Um, I've got a Facebook page. I do share content on there. But really, the place to be is my mailing list. That's where I share the, the most stuff I'm I'm, a, I'm an old school email marketer social media is too overwhelming for me it's just another piece so um yeah email is probably the best place but if you follow my Facebook page selling from the heart if you don't want to be on my mailing list my Facebook page selling from the heart if you follow that we share all the the content that goes out by email we share quite a lot of it on there but not everything no perfect well, I've loved having you today. Good luck with your launch and everything else in between. And um, I'll hope I'll have you back in a couple of years time again. Maybe not as long as that next time. Yeah, we'll do it sooner. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Thanks again, Catherine. Thank you for having me. It's been a brilliant conversation. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of Accelerate Your Wealth. For further help or to connect with Rebecca directly, please head over to the website www.rebeccarobertson.co.uk where you can find further information on our planner, book and how to further maximise your wealth. Our sponsor, Evolution Financial Planning for regulated advice on pensions, investments, mortgages, insurances on www.evolutionfinancialplanning.co.uk forward slash podcast.